how Singapore became rich. Today, Singapore is one of the most thriving cities and countries in the world. The little island nation at the southern tip of the Asian mainland boasts a population of 5.6 million people, which have the second highest GDP per capita out of any country in the world. The glamorous skyscrapers around Marina Bay and the buzzing financial district attract a lot of global enterprise and its strategic position at the end of the Malacca Strait boosts Singapore's position as a global logistics hub. While it's now almost impossible to envision Singapore as a meaningless dot on a map with one of the largest slum populations of any country, this was actually reality less than 70 years ago. Chapter 1 – The Beginnings up until the 16th century, the island was ruled by either Siamese kings of today's Thailand or under the control of the Majapit Empire of today's Indonesia. In 1613, Portuguese raiders have burned the settlements of the island to the ground, after which the region fell into obscurity until the Englishman and former governor of the Dutch East Indies rediscovered its strategic importance in 1819. Singapore spent 150 years under British rule until the Japanese invasion during the Second World War overwhelmed the British troops, which led to a declining image of the British in the Singaporean public consciousness and ultimately led to an independence movement. The following 20 years after World War II, Singapore gained its independence from Britain, briefly joined the newly formed Malaysian Federation, but eventually went a path of independence due to mistreatment and a subsequent expulsion. The rather involuntary independence of Singapore was off to a rough start, with race riots and strikes plaguing the then third world country. Opposite to many former colonies, however, Singapore held close ties with their former colonial overlord Britain and adopted their Westminster system of governance, which made Lee Kuan Yew the first democratically elected prime minister of Singapore. Yew immediately got to work on a rapid shift of the economy, heavily supporting entrepreneurship and creating an inviting environment for the world to make business in Singapore. Even though he was a democratically elected prime minister, Yu moved the government to a more authoritarian political system, making heavy use of gerrymandering and virtually creating a one-party system. This concentration of power allowed him and his party, the People's Action Party, to have a strong guiding hand on the country's policies and economy in the form of a dynamic master plan to guide Singapore's land use and development. At this point in time, Singapore's industry still mainly focused on manufacturing of things like tin and rubber, but by outpacing its neighbors in terms of economic growth and raising the standard of living, Singaporean labor started to be too expensive and uncompetitive. This called for another shift of the economy, which was taken on with high levels of foresight and stability in mind. Chapter 2 – The Rise It was around this time in the 1980s where Singapore made just the right decision. Once again, Singapore shifted its economy, this time to high-tech industries such as wafer fabrication, producing semiconductors, microprocessors and optical computer equipment, which serve the growing demand of a world which is about to become digitalized. At the same time, the National Changi Airport opened, connecting the rapidly growing country with the rest of the world, and the port of Singapore became one of the busiest ports in the world. This harbour allowed Singapore to take the role as an extremely profitable oil refining nation, even though the island itself is almost completely starved of natural resources. Virtually any tanker and container ship which traverses from the Indian Ocean to the Pacific sails through the Strait of Malacca and Singapore just so happened to be almost perfectly in the middle between the oil producing Middle East and the oil consuming China, Japan and South Korea, which made the port of Singapore the go-to station for refueling, resupplying and reshuffling cargo. Chapter 3 – Singapore Today Fast forward to the 20th century and Singapore is on top of almost any international ranking for wealth, education, development and the ease of doing business. Low income and corporate tax rates and many possibilities for tax deductions combined with a very stable and corruption-free political landscape invite many foreign enterprises to set up operations which accelerate Singapore's position as a financial and logistic hub on the world stage. As a result of this, Singapore stands as a gateway to conduct business in Asia for many international businesses. The importance of political stability can be seen in the example of Hong Kong, who enjoyed a similar powerful position as Singapore. Increasing tensions with China, however, make foreign investors lose confidence in Hong Kong, which severely hurts its future development. 
Many Singaporeans study at renowned international institutions, which is actually sponsored by the government. The only condition for people participating in the program, however, is that they subsequently return to Singapore and take on a job in the public sector. Being a civil servant is one of the highest viewed professions in the small country and promises a very competitive salary. Due to this, the public administration runs efficiently, and many public institutions such as the public transport sector purposefully compete with private companies, so that only the most efficient and the most beneficial solution survives. This efficient public sector has spawned many initiatives which make Singapore one of the best places to live in. With the rapid growth that the nation underwent in the past 60 years and the very limited space on the island, there was bound to be problems arising in the housing sector. To tackle the ever-growing housing demand which started in the 1960s with heaps of immigrants coming in from China, India and Malaysia, the government put a lot of focus on providing affordable housing. The Home Ownership for the People scheme has constructed hundreds of thousands of affordable high-rise buildings across the whole island and subsidizes the lease of these units to all people on the social ladder. Homeowners are not allowed to resell their property within the first five years to discourage prices from being driven up and the governmentally subsidized housing today results in over 90% home ownership in Singapore. Further schemes demand that every housing block must house a minimum quota of the three main ethnicities which call Singapore home, which ensures the prevention of racial enclaves, which promotes diversity and intercultural exchange. All in all, Singapore is a prime example of how society can make the leap from being a developing nation to a highly developed nation in just one generation. It shows that governmental policies with foresight and dynamic adaptations to the world's needs can rapidly improve the life of its people and the leveraging of your geographical position by heavily engaging in the world trade can lead to a successful country despite the lack of natural resources and the turmoil that the country started off with. Thanks for watching, subscribe and leave a comment if you enjoyed it and want to see more like it. Cheers.